Welcome to this Sunday's virtual class from the Brigham Young University Family History Library at Provo, Utah. Today's class is How to Avoid Genealogical Blindness. Our presenter is James Tanner. We appreciate his preparation and willingness to share his knowledge on this subject. We'll now turn the time over to Brother Tanner. Okay, well, we're glad to be here again today. Today, uh, we're going to talk about how to avoid genealogical blindness. And I am certain that all of us have some area of genealogy that is blind to us because either we don't know enough to know that we're blind or that we know so much that we want to be intentionally blind. How's that? You can be either way, whatever you want to, whatever you want to choose. So First of all, we need to understand that we're surrounded by generations of our ancestors. Uh, you might be surprised uh, any time uh, that you were getting in a group that maybe would cooperate. If you pull out your iPhone or your Android phone, you can go to the FamilySearch.org uh, app on the, the Family Tree app on the either device. And there's a program in there called Relatives Around Me. And if you uh, click on that and have your app open and they, everyone else has their app open, they have to, everybody has to be on that Family Search app. And then you can see everybody that you're related to, at least through the family tree. And if they have uh, friends or whatever, I mean, relatives or whatever in the family tree. So that helps. But obviously, it's not universal, and it's possible that you did that, and you might be you might be uh, discouraged because no one has, well, probably because no one has the app or no one has worked on the family tree. But uh, that's that doesn't mean you don't have a lot of relatives around you. Um, and that gives us a kind of a different perspective on life when we when we realize that. So, what we're talking about here is can we see beyond our own current generation the people around us right now that we are aware of uh, whether we're real aware of a lot of relatives or very few relatives we still have a tendency to focus on our immediate living people relatives and kind of forget that we have a, a great vast ocean of of deceased relatives who have preceded us. And so it's kind of, uh, and, and it's a little bit disconcerting to people who don't know that they are related to a lot of people because they have no, uh, they have no feeling for what kind of background they had in their, in their family, where did they come from? How did they get to where they are now? What kinds of things in their lives happened that were either good or bad? And all of that is part of the the idea that we so suddenly become part of this greater uh, relative community that is that is uh, potentially very very large. It's a simple thing here. Is when I keep saying that is uh, is it's uh, a geometric progression because you have two parents and four grandparents and eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twelve. Uh, 128, 256, 512, et cetera. That's 512 when you get back that many generations and all the people of who are descended of those 512 people. And what I'll emphasize during this presentation is that uh, current DNA testing and uh, this, the examination of DNA tests it, by vast numbers of people, now we have DNA tests for, for literally millions and millions of people across the world has shown us that we are all interrelated. Everyone in the world is, is related to everyone else. And it may not be as far back as you might suspect. If your family came from uh, Europe, for example, everybody in Europe has been determined to be subject, to be a descendant of one person, maybe it's a few people, but essentially one or two people. So going back only that, uh, say 15 or 20 generations, it turns out that you're, you're related to everybody. 
so this is the thing that we're that I'm talking about today that we if we sort of are unaware and I use the term blind as an analogy that we can't see or can't perceive the fact that we have all of these relatives then uh, we really don't interact with the world the same way if we understand that uh, we're we're completely related um one place uh, I live in, of course, in, in Utah at the present time, but most of my life in, in Arizona. In both places, my families were uh, huge. My ancestors all had a whole lots of children, and relatives to me were always somebody. No matter where I was and where I was in Utah or Arizona, I seem to run into people who are, who are my cousins and, and are related to me. So that's not something that I had to uh, learn or I had to investigate because I grew up having all those people available and all those people talking about me. But the question that we're facing today with people who are trying to do their genealogical research is that uh, the question is, they do they have the necessary historical vision into the past to do genealogical research? In other words, Genealogical research isn't just adding a bunch of names to a to a chart and coming up with a, with a name. It, it is putting those people into a historical context, and good research, valid research, uh, research that uh, is is accurate to the extent that documents are available. It depends essentially on a person's ability to understand the historical context of the, each of the people that they're looking for. So there's so many things out there that that uh, determine whether or not uh, your ancestors are going to be fairly simply determined or whether they're going to be more difficult to find. And all that has to do with the history of, of the various parts of the world. So we understand and should relate relate to connect this that genealogy is really history it's just history on uh, where you're focusing on an individual and a family you're you're not looking at like the big pictures but then you have to put that individual and family into their context of their of how the world was functioning and what was going on in the world at the time that you uh that that genealogy was being that your ancestors were living, having children and having families. So this is kind of the idea. And and uh, I get so many people, uh, the one I always go back to is, I was teaching a class a number of years ago and there were about eight or 10 people in the class. And, and I uh, uh, was talking about this historical context and I, and I said, uh, was illustrating it with this family and i said well okay so this family lived in such and such a part i don't remember where it's probably pennsylvania and i said and it was uh 1860s at 1861 62 63 these people were were living here and having children and then there's some things that are going on after that family so what was important i just made this kind of as a rhetorical question i said well what was it that was important in the united states in 18 and say 1862 to 65 and and they just stared at me i mean none of them re responded to that and i said no no i have a question what happened during those years in the united states and they looked at it at me like i was speaking some foreign language and then i said well does do any of you know about like the civil war and there was still no recognition there and they thought and then one of them said oh do you mean to say that the civil war was in that time period and i said uh yeah this is the american civil war like a million people died and you know that was the civil war and he said and they all went oh oh so that kind of indicated to me that this was kind of the subject that I might want to talk about occasionally is connecting your, your going beyond the fact that you're just staring at this list of names and looking at the background and the environment and the, 
and the cultural, social, historical environment of the people that you're dealing with in uh, in doing genealogical research. So almost without saying so, every time I look at a person, so in, a, in the context of doing genealogical research, I spend the first few minutes determining exactly where some events occurred in their lives, determining what the time period was, what's the availability of the records, were they in the middle of a war, were they in the middle of where they were poor, were they rich, where did they live, what kind of a town was it, was it a little town, was it a big town, was it a big city, all of these things began to create a picture of what it's like and what it will take to find records of an individual in those different circumstances. And so basically we're looking at expanding beyond this narrow, you know, nearsighted view of our families and, and becoming aware of what's going on. And in that context, um, your family is more than just a bunch of names on a list. And that's, that's I think, the, the major thing that, if I'm going to say anything more, is just is that, that we don't think of ourselves as just another list of people that we, we're related to, but that these were all real people. They lived, they died, they had families, they fought, they loved each other, they did whatever families do and sometimes it's great good sometimes it's not but it's always our history they are real people they did real things and to the extent that we're able to make that connection with our parents grandparents great grandparents great great grandparents then that's to the extent that when you're doing genealogy you have the interest and motivation to actually uh, become involved in in the the lives of the people to the extent that it isn't just a cut and dried trying to find this person's name on a record it is finding an actual person who had an actual life and we can th then we can have some relationship with that person because we know who they are and how they're connected to us what they had to go through and where they were living at that time. And that's not something that just comes. Uh, it's unfortunate, but right now, for instance, in the United States, if you're elsewhere, you may have a different experience, but in the United States, uh, history is absolutely at the bottom of every uh, everyone's knowledge base. History is just almost completely lacking uh, they don't, it's not taught systematically in schools, it's not uh, emphasized, and uh, people have basically been cast free or cast out into a, a kind of float free from, from any kind of history because they don't know it, and they don't have the, the ability to, to understand it. So what we've got is a, a challenge because in order to do this kind of genealogical research that we talk about, we need to know that. We need to know these basic things and all the history and where happened. So here's an example. My great great my great grandfather was born in 1842. That was before the US Civil War. That's my great grandfather. So I'm here in 2023, and my father, father's father's was born in 1842 before the American U.S. Civil War. And I didn't know him because he died 10 years before I was born. But I knew my great-grandmother, who was born in 1865 during the war. She was actually born during the Civil War, and I know, knew her personally. In fact, she was still alive when I was married and... Uh, in my 20s and so it's not that far back it's not uh, it's not ancient history it is real history 
Now, I realize that my great-grandchildren, I have great-grandchildren, my great-grandchildren uh, would feel overwhelmingly far back in time. It would be like ancient history to someone who who lived almost 200 years ago. But for someone who overlaps that, it's it's not. It's just a brief period of time, and you can see why we're uh, why I would be talking about this. So here's uh, here's another example. Um, my great grandfather, that same great grandfather's grandfather, was born before the Revolutionary War in 1776. So when you put it that way, that that my actual so so I go back. And my great grandfather, my grandfather, uh, who I did, my grandfather, who I, that grandfather I did not know, but because he died early. But as we go back in time and we learn about these things, my great grandmother I knew. I didn't know my grandfather and grandmother. My grandmother died before my great grandmother died. My great grandmother, my grandmother died when she was very young. She was 32 years old. My great-grandmother lived to be in her 90s, and so I knew my great-grandmother. And so this is kind of the, the, the thing we have. Now, you say, well, I never knew any of my grandparents. I never knew anybody. I, I'm just totally out there. Well, that's why we have people get interested in genealogy, because doing, by doing this research and finding out who these people are and... Uh, and discovering their lives and discovering where and how they lived, we begin to get that connection. We begin to understand how and where these people are. I might mention that I, that's really my only, I only had one great grandmother and I never knew my father's grand, my father's parents. And I, uh, I knew my mother's parents much better than my, well, I never knew my father's parents at all. They both died before I was born, but my mother's parents lived long enough that I was able to stay with them and learn that, talk to them and be aware of them. And so we have this, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things, but as you do genealogy, you, you, you not only develop a concept of the relationship that you have to these people, but you begin to understand and know these people. It takes a great, it takes, it, it takes a lot of research, believe me. I mean, for some people, it is a, a tremendous task to, to even find their parents or their grandparents. But other people, uh, as they go along, they'll begin to find this, this group of people that they're related to. So I would ask, what do you know about your own generations of ancestors? Um, People always ask me, well, how far back do you go? Well, my answer would never be how far back did I go, but my answer, my question I think would be the good question to ask in genealogical context would be, how well do you know your grandparents and your great-grandparents? How well do you know where they lived, how they lived, who they were, uh, what uh, they did for a living, how they uh, managed uh, uh, where did they go to school? How kinds the kinds of things that uh, would be uh, uh, the kinds of things that you'd want to know about a friend. And so these people then become your your relatives and your friends, and you get to know them as you get to know them. So here's the question: Is well, what if you have a lot of relatives? What if you're in a family like mine, for example, where uh, there have been people in my family interested in genealogy for well over 100 years, going back into the 1800s, and have been doing com uh, compiled uh, genealogies and all sorts of things. And so I, I can sit here and look at like this at a 10-generation uh, family group record, I mean a fan chart, and uh, see that there are very few people out, even out six, seven generations or eight generations, and uh, it takes going back way back in time before we find that there are a lot of holes in uh, in the in the genealogy. So, what do you do with an overwhelming number of people like this? Well, the answer is it's a good news and a bad news thing. So good news is you're going to continually have people to look for and uh, people to 
to become related to in a sense because you'll discover them and and be related to them but on the other hand uh, you don't really get the kind of discovery process that a person who who turns out to be have almost no information about their family as you if you're in that position then you've got a great opportunity for discovery you you've got an opportunity to really begin to know people that you had no idea existed and didn't know you were related to and you may be surprised in some ways because they're they were such uh, great people or on the other hand you may be surprised because they were not so great people but on either way you're going to have an interesting and enjoyable and very very rewarding experience in beginning to come become aware of of each of these people but what happens if if you're an orphan or a foundling a foundling meaning someone who was left on a on a doorstep at a fire station or a hospital or a church and uh, nobody really knows who they are and and just a few years ago this this was a, a, a this was a tremendous obstacle to finding a family uh today uh it is not it is simply not as as difficult as it was at one time it may be difficult to track down uh, the living people because we have privacy laws and we have difficulties in in uh, finding people who are alive the reality of genealog genealogical research at least here in the United States and it's very similar in other countries that I've done research in it is far easier to find somebody a hundred years ago than it is to find somebody who lived in the last 10 15 20 50 years 60 years once you get back over this kind of it's not an imaginary line but it's a line of privacy when when dead people don't really have any privacy under in laws in the United States for example but uh, some places uh, it's more or less difficult to find people who live within a certain period of time of the present uh, all due to uh, privacy laws but once you go past those and get past that cultural issue then it's it's easier to find the records because they're not uh, nearly so as, as restricted as those that uh, deal with people that may be living so what's the first step here what would you do to get started here obviously you still have millions of relatives the fact that you know about the people does not affect the numbers you still have people out there that you're related to and when we talk about being related we're talking about going back all of those generations and then coming forward with all the children of all those generations and all the iterations of all those families and those people are your cousins they're your relatives and so you're you're just as related to them as you are to anyone else and uh, you may have uh, you know because of the way that day and dna is expressed and and uh, the jargon and and uh, way that people are are let's say selling dna today it uh, it sounds like it's really complicated but really it isn't it, you just have uh, dna is a uh, a measure of the number of dna matches that you have to, that you have with somebody and that's either a lot or a little and the, the more it is the closer you're related the further the less it is the further away you're related and that's kind of all the dna does uh, when you get down to it and you can determine whether you're related to one specific person if you spend a lot of time doing research but it's still a matter of uh, of just proximity so what do you do you go take a dna test if you are in that situation go take a DNA test from a website with a huge number of family trees so the, the the larger the number of people on their website the larger the database of people that they're going to match you with when you do a DNA test the the greater the chance that you're going to find relatives and they'll start coming in and finding the relatives for you and and if you are a subscriber to these programs they will uh, start matching you up to all of these people but that then creates a challenge to you because you have to figure out how you're really related to these people and who was 
the common ancestor of all these people that you keep coming. If they show you a thing that you, they say, like you're a fifth cousin, three generations removed, that's going to be a lot of people out there. That there's a lot of choices with that because of the of the doubling of the number of people. So you really can't be sure until you start doing your research and getting a family tree how you're really developed. Now, if they tell you you have a, a, a degree of relationship that this person is a sibling or a parent, then they've answered your orphan question. So, or their your foundling question. And that's that's just going to happen. In other words, they'll tell you, well, yeah, you've got this guy. But what does that mean? It means that that other person actually took a DNA test and was able to, and was on that particular program that you used to uh, to put your DNA to get your DNA test. So how do you make sure you maximize that? Well, you take you you get a on a bunch of different. If you're really trying to solve this or orphan or family problem, you get on a number of different websites and take their different and put all your information that you know about your family, if you know any, on that website. And then you can begin to try to understand who these people are. And you may end up having to contact the people to, to um, find out if, if they know. And unfortunately, that's a problem because a lot of the people um, that you see on these larger websites do not have um, a large family tree. So it's not automatic that you can figure out how, how you're related because they may not know themselves. And so somebody has to do the research to, to sort out all these people. Of course, if you're talking about sorting out your parents, so and you find out that this person, but yeah, but once again, I'm going to repeat that so it makes sense. If you're if your proposed parent, your actual person that that's and they're still alive and they're still able to get a DNA test, then that person has to have taken the test from somebody who has a database like a an ancestry or my heritage or 23andMe or some other program that you can get matched to. And, and absent that, that person is not going to be any more discoverable. But the nature of the of the um, what I've been talking about is that there are so many other relatives out there that you will get you will get DNA matches. But then without doing the research, without working your way backward in time, uh, you're not going to automatically know how you're related to it, these people. And you may, without contacting a, a number of them and getting information from a number of them, be able to figure out who they were related to that that basically uh, turns out to be your your parent, your, your grandparents, your ancestor, or whoever it is. So that's kind of the challenge of what's happening, and that's what it goes. So... You may be looking at the forest and not seeing the trees. In other words, you're looking at the, the the vast number of people out there who surround you, perhaps, who are related to you, even if they're in another country or if they're in another culture or wherever they are. But there's these people are out there, but you're not seeing the individuals because you haven't done the steps like take a DNA test, develop a family tree and understand the connections and who these people are to see the individuals. So you're looking at the forest and, and, and not seeing the trees. So there's a survey that was taken here in the United States just recently. This just came out not too long ago. Uh, this one was in 2000 and wherever too, but they just keep having them all the time. Uh, there was one done recently by Ancestry that came up with the same res same results. Uh, more than half these people in the United States can't name all four of their grandparents. They just don't know who they are. They can't give them a name, and so they're they're basically blind to what we're talking about here: this generational cloud, this generational forest, or whatever. 
they don't know that they're related to whoever they're related to. They may have, they may live right next door to one of their first cousins and not know it. So this is the, this is the kind of the situation that actually did exist out there. <clears throat> so what we do is we start learning about our immediate family. We need to know the details of our immediate family. And you say, well, that's really easy for you to say because you already have all this information. And my answer is, yeah. But you'd be surprised at how much work it took. Maybe you wouldn't be surprised if you've done it yourself. But it is a lot of work to work through and actually verify all of that information that came in for 100 years ago. Uh, it, it took me a tremendous amount of time. They didn't have computers. They did not have uh, databases where they can put their information. The information was scattered in books and in paper and in journals and letters, and it had to be put together into something that looked like that giant fan chart. So that was this, that's the results of, of not just inheriting it all, but it was a matter of analyzing and going through and in a, in a real sense correcting all of the information that had been gathered over the years most many, much of which was very duplicative and not very right and not very complete so the important thing is once you get started once you get into this mode of of looking is to record your discoveries in other words you have to start organizing and recording and there's no reason in the world to try and reinvent the wheel. We're not here saying, oh, we have a new way to do everything and we're going to make your life really easy and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just, you know, that, 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 if someone's trying to sell you that, then that's like, uh, you know, the old uh, snake oil or whatever or stuff the, they used to sell because there's nothing out there that, that makes it any simpler. It just organizes it. And so you're going to be working with uh, a, something that looks like this. This is a pedigree chart that shows parents. Why is this 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 particular pedigree chart shows what we what I call a Western European bias? In other words, this is a modular family that that we have created this idealized family with a, a child and two parents going back into time when that may or may not be true. And that, uh, and so in reality, this chart is, does not work well. It, it uh, makes you think that uh, there are certain blanks that have to be filled. And then you, when you fill them all, you're through. Well, that's not true because that's not the way these families are. And many of my ancestors had one, more than one wife and many of them had a uh, dozen, uh, actually up to two dozen children. And so basically there's, uh, you know, there's a lot more work on these lists than, than it looks like. But this is a good place to start, at least gives you a framework for understanding the basic structure that, that's out there. So for regardless of the fact that, for instance, your grandfather had more than one wife, your grandmother on that line is only one person. So there's, you know, this is kind of the way that the, the situation now what if happens if you have adopted parents and or for uh, guardianship parents or foster parents or anything else that well you can do all those research you, you were not limited by by uh, biological relationships we basically have the can can do research on any line we feel is interesting anything that we're interested in finding out anything that we want to know about our ancestry uh, we can do that my Father's mother, as I mentioned, uh, died when he was eight years old, and um, he had a stepmother. So I have, I have a an opportunity there to do work, even though you'd say, well, you're not really related to that stepmother. And the answer is, uh, in a way, I am, because she was part of my father's life as a mother. And so that's something that I need to take into consideration and be aware of and, and uh, research if I feel like I want to research that person. So 
let's go on. Let's so start, just start entering. Now, why would you want to enter them into a free family search.org family tree? Well, the answer is very straightforward and simple. It's free, which is the first thing. But secondly, it's a unified tree. That means everyone is using and entering information into the same family tree. And so you're going to avoid a splintering off. So it's it's just, you know, people think, well, I'll just go on and I'll just do my own personal family tree. Well, the problem is you may be re just redoing work that's been done already 50 times or 100 times by other people. And how do you know that unless you have a uh, family tree like the, the family search family tree where the information is all put in one position? Of course, there's going to be arguments coming back about uh, the issues with dealing with a family tree that is unified and, and open and anyone can either enter and change and do things with. But uh, um, having my own position, I've talked on this and you can find uh, any number of, of uh, blog posts and uh, videos that we've done on this subject. So that's just not the, that's not the point. The point is here that that's one thing. You may want to have your tree on another form, on another place where you have control over what you're there, but you're you're losing the fact that there are other people involved and they maybe have more. Now, if you're on other, on other family trees, the larger generation, uh, if you have a, a tree on, for instance, Ancestry or MyHeritage or whatever, then those programs usually will advise you of all the other people that have your names in their family tree, but you're not able to see that all together in, in one context, and that's why it's important to have something uh, like the family search family tree that gives you the straight, the everybody's contributions at one time, rather than having to look at this person's tree and this person's tree and this person's tree. So it really be able. So you may also be surprised about the all the existing information that all, that it, that's there about your family. Um, once you start getting into people who are dead, you stop, you know, you enter in the living people for a while, and then you get to your first dead people, you may connect uh, with the dead person and find out that there's already a lot of information. And that happens, um, that can't happen unless the, the, the tree actually is driving the, uh, the research and the connections that, that you need to make. So if you want to learn more, in other words, now you're at the point where we're saying, well, I don't know how to do all this and I can't do it, or I need a lot more skills, or I, I need to learn what's going on. Then we have some basic things. This is the family history guide. Uh, it is a program that's free and it is uh, a learning program that gives you step-by-step -step instructions to do, to work with the online websites like Family Search and Ancestry and I keep mentioning my, find my past. I didn't mention find my past and and my heritage and others. Uh, it also gives you some basics on research in every country of the world that has uh, any kind of records that are available. And it is uh, it is used by uh, the BYU Family History Library as the basis for the training of their missionaries. It's used by the Family History Library, and that's now the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City for, for training their volunteer missionaries and uh, across the country. And it is really a uh, one way to get started in all this and, and get a lot of your questions answered by working through uh, the step-by-step -step instructions with uh, with also supported by videos. This program does not have the records. It's not a records resource. It is an instructional resource. Then the next step here is we have the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. That's uh, where these classes and all the other and the webinars and other uh, instructional materials that we create uh, at the rate of about three or four a week uh, are are uploaded for, for free view. So now we have uh, going well over 800 uh, videos on there in all sorts of subjects. And uh, there's a, a way to spend some time. If you learn visually, which I do, then uh, watching the videos helps immensely. 
if you learn by reading, uh, then you have the family history guide and videos or whatever. So there's a lot of way, different ways to learn the information you need to, to make these connections with uh, the people and answer specific questions. So I'm going to repeat this. If you have many known relatives or just a few, a DNA test and some basic research will give you a place to start. So you'll you'll pretty you'll pretty much by starting to do uh, with a DNA test on a on a like I said on a on a big website that has a lot of of uh, people already on their on their family trees, then they will start telling you that you're matched to all these people, and that gives you a sort of a basis. And uh, in the case of, for example, my heritage, you can use the program to contact the people directly and, and, and ask who they are. And they may not answer, but uh, in a lot of cases they do. And you may very well end up establishing some very productive relationships with some of your relatives. So this is what it'll start giving you. So the DNA test is kind of the key. It'll start giving you the connections. So you'll see that you have all these people that they've reported you're related, related to. But unless you come back and look at the DNA test and look at the people and then put it into the context of starting to try to discover a family tree, uh, then you're, that's when you'll begin to see that you have a lot of connections and a lot of relatives to work with. Now, what happens uh, if you don't understand what's going on, then you're back to uh, coming to the BYU Family History Library on our virtual fa uh, Family History Help uh, Zoom that's on during the days of the week for, uh, for people just to get on and ask questions. Or you can go to Family History Center, uh, now called Family Search Centers across the world. You can go to... Uh, you can get help from many, many different areas. And like I've mentioned already, the Family History Guide and the BYU videos that helps you get past this thing. But then you, you know, regardless of what kind of information you, you choose to, to start with, you have to start by organizing that. You have to know uh, what it is. It might be just really fabulous to find out that your father, who your real father is, or your genetically related father. But that may not that may not that may raise more question than it answers so you may want to get together with him and um and start talking about his relatives and then getting uh, putting them the people on that are showing up in your dna tests and on your different uh, as you do some research that uh, put them in kind of an organization so you can start to see how how all of these uh, the information that you're obtaining is re is related and gives you your relationship. Um, there's ways to get started here on familysearch.org. There's a, a set of, if you go to familysearch.org and look for DNA information, uh, it'll be pretty hard if you just go click on the on the website. But if you use a Google search and search for, for the DNA testing information, they will, there's quite a basic understanding here and there's links and, and suggestions of places to go and, and ways to get started with, with DNA testing right on familysearch.org. So it's a, what the reality is though, and this is, this is what I think is kind of the, it's the, uh, What's the not the failure? It's not a failure. It's more of a, a uh, create gaps and uh, lack of information. Is that only a small percentage of the people who take DNA tests have a researched family tree? So you can see here. This is a couple of people. I've blacked out the names so you can't see the individuals' names. But basically, uh, here you can see that it's this person has a uh, first cousin twice removed or a second cousin once removed, and he appears in a family tree with only five people. So he may, he, she may not, it's a he here in this case, he may not even know how he's related to me or that he is related to me because he doesn't have a family tree. And I come up as a DNA match, but that doesn't tell him who I am in a sense, in the sense of being how I'm related. And there's no way I know how I'm related unless I can contact this person 
and he happens to know and they may not know who their parents grandparents etc are and so that ends that it could be any number of people but usually with surnames and and looking and doing some kind of minimal research both you and the person you're contacting through through these uh through taking a dna test this one by the way is from my heritage so they have contacts directly with the people through the program so you can just click on that and say by the way who are you and why do you only have one person in your family tree so that's uh you know this is the kind of thing that you might have of course they don't have to answer and you basically may have to end up trying a number of people before you get people to answer because they may never even look at the program and may not even know that you tried to contact them so without a, t a family tree a dna test is little more than than entertainment uh it'll tell you uh, an ethnicity report it'll tell you how uh that maybe uh, your ancestors came from someplace in europe or asia or africa or, or south america or someplace but they won't tell you uh they won't tell you much specific uh unless your ancestors your relatives your parents that you're looking for or whoever have also taken a test from that dna testing source so you're really kind of of dependent on other people being involved to the extent that they will get testing but i wouldn't let that slow you down just because you don't know that because they don't respond immediately or you don't find anybody who is your immediate a family relative i would start looking through and doing some research because as you create a family tree you cre you create the basis for determining in a sense how how they they should be or must be related to you so that's that's kind of the way that it works in that in that circumstances okay but if you're an orphan and a foundling uh, you're the exception here is that if in fact that parent that missing parent or that missing relative has taken a dna test then you're going to have sort of immediate feedback immediate fulfillment because if it comes up and says this person is the dna match shows that this person is your parent then uh, you obviously have found somebody whether they'll respond or whether you'll have any contact with them is going to depend heavily on the people but that gives you at least a place to start out with and maybe a surname and some information about that person that uh, may help pull you, help you in in developing some more uh, research along that lines along with other relatives who are identified uh, through the DNA process. Now, this is basically all developed in the last few years. Uh, uh, before the first uh, genealogical DNA test became available in any quantity, there was no way of knowing. You'd had to go through the actual physical research to find a, a, an adoptive parent. And as far as a founding was concerned, a person who had no uh, official notice of who their parents were, uh, there was really no practical way to find that other than doing some kind of of search in the in the immediate area where the foundling was left and to see if there was some other record that may indicate who the baby was or who you were when you were born so that's that's kind of the situation that you find yourself in so where does that put us well, first of all, we've got to go back when you do get a, a DNA test and understand what it means to have an ethnicity estimate. It's an estimate. In other words, this has evolved. The, what you see on your this uh, my one of my ethnicity estimates, and what I see here has changed considerably over the past five or six years, seven years that this has been going on. Uh, the what's what they're telling me now about how who i'm related to and which area i'm related in is still to this point from an ethnicity ethnicity estimate is standpoint is kind of 
vague and not really helpful. Uh, for example, on this particular chart that comes up on my heritage, I show a significant percentage in Italy and another percentage in the Middle East and another percentage in the Balkans up in Lithuania and Lit Latvia and Estonia and up there. <laughs> and the problem I have is that I have years of years and years and years of research. I don't find anybody, I've never had anybody show up as a relative in, on any of the research I've done in Italy or the Middle East or the Baltics. But as time goes on, we have, I have enough information now and uh, we've done enough research. When I say we, me and my immediate family members, uh, my, mostly my daughters have done as enough research that we can actually answer that question. So for example, the question of the Baltics, I have Jew, Jewish ancestors who came to the Netherlands and they are they originated somewhere to the east probably in germany and then they could have come further than that and so uh, it's very possible that these people who migrated across europe uh, who ended up in the netherlands uh, are the ones that are showing up there with mice percentages in the baltics the same thing for italy i have nearly 75 percent all of my dna from england but England isn't very uniform. And one of the things that is the background of England is that they were inhabited by Roman soldiers for uh, for more than hundreds, a couple of hundred years. And so there's plenty of opportunity for Italian DNA to have entered the stream of the Roman, of people living in England. What about the Middle East? That's a little more remote and problematical, but it turns out that uh, it's possible that two of my great-great-grandmothers, my two of my great, my great-great-grandmother and, and back in her family uh, were in, in fact uh, Romani. And that means that they were gypsies. And that means they came from ultimately from that area of the Middle East back enough time. So it's very interesting that maybe these people who I now have identified after so many years of research uh, as being remote ancestors, their back generations uh, on all of these possibilities are now showing up in my ethnicity estimate. And that's so that an ethnicity estimate, although it on the surface looked like, yeah, how is that possible? Uh, turns out to be that it is possible because I now know the history, the people and the migration patterns. And, uh, and that helps me to understand that my family very well could have come from those parts of the of the world. So <clears throat> you, it, basically, why would you want to know about your ancestors? What is it <clears throat> that's the driving force for that? And it's something that perhaps you need to know personally, sorry, and that is uh, is a health history. And this is a list, uh, you can find it online just about any places. I just gave one reference to it here. Uh, these are all the medical problems and approximate age that are caused by some kind of genetic issues. These are all genetically related illnesses, defects or whatever you want to call them. And so if you have any of this and you want to know the propensity or your parents had it, you maybe you'd want to know all this. And that's one of the, that's a very high percentage of people who get initially involved in genealogy, get, get involved because of, of this possibility of them having some kind of a, a genetically uh, caused or genetically induced or a genetically assisted uh, type of problem that's lifted here on this uh, long, long list. And so that's another reason for getting a DNA test and knowing to some extent. Now, the ones you get for, for genealogy are not necessarily complete enough to di diagnose your medical condition. They may be or they may not be. It just depends on the company. But uh, if you do get a complete one, you can still use that information on to, to for genetic purposes. And the, and the cost of these tests are not so prohibitive that you couldn't take one or two or three of them. 
Another problem is that family relationships are enduring. In other words, there's things that uh, they 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 create an, a, a way of, of becoming a known a person. Many years ago, uh, I was involved heavily in uh, in being involved with the homeless community uh, here in Arizona, and uh, for for a number of years and. It was apparent back then, and it's still apparent today, that one of the major effects, cause and effect of homelessness, is that people become disassociated with their with their family structure, their their uh, whatever it is, their church or family that is their support structure, support community. So when they leave that that support community, then they have a greater risk of of becoming. Uh, a homeless person. So family relationships are important and you can establish those even if your family did not create those through contacting and doing the research. You can you can often, and I've seen it happen over and over and over again as I've helped people find their families, is that they can, uh, they then begin relating to their families and it becomes uh, a support system for them. So there's the, the relatives around me with the mobile app that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, so that's one way to get to, to start getting some information. There's another one called Relative Finder from the BYU Family History Technology Lab. And that is uh, uh, that depends on whether or not you have uh, a, a lot of information in the family search family tree. The more you have, the more relatives you'll show up with Relative Finder. And uh, you may do like me and find out that you're related to your spouse or your uh, other surprising relations. But also, you've got a little bit of a of an, uh, caution here. Don't believe it all because the family tree is not necessarily 100% correct. In fact, it, in some areas, when you get way back in time, it may be not correct at all. Okay, so... There are some other reasons for learning about your family. Second, first of all, it gives your life more meaning. It increases your sense of identity, stimulates your mental activity. It's difficult to do and it's uh, challenging and gives you something very positive to do uh, in, your, uh, in your time as you grow older. And it improves and discovers family relations. It's just gives you some way of connecting directly to your families. So don't, but don't forget that genealogy is history, and you have to be able to understand the context of this as you build back and learn about your family. You should be learning about the history and the, and the culture and, and everything of the countries and the people and the places where they came from. So you're not uh, just sort of getting a bunch of names that don't mean anything. So always put your family into the historical context. Always have them firmly placed in the areas and the, and the time frames that they lived so that that's, you have some meaning out of all this information that you're obtaining. And you'll find out there's a lot to learn, especially if you take the blinders off and you're not blinded by your uh, lack of history and, and uh, genealogical information. And then you can actually see who you are and where those people were and, and understand and that someday you may stand like I did and look at uh, look at a house foundation of a house and realize that it was your family and your family that were living there in that house and the connection then becomes real. Okay, well, thanks for watching.